All right, so we're going to have a pretty big topic this week, uh, the French Revolution. But before we get to that, there is, you know, we finished up with the scientific revolution. We finished up with the Enlightenment. There is some other things happening in the 1700s that don't fit into one nice neat category. Sometimes I call this my miscellaneous lecture or just my life in the 1700s lecture. So we're just going to go through a few things. They are each of them important. They just don't, there are a bunch of important things that don't fit into one category. But I do want you to know these things. A couple of them are going to obviously possibly come up on your midterms. So you do want to obviously know all this. Uh, so just normal, take notes, um, you know, and then it'll be kind of probably a little shorter lecture. And then the next lecture will be on the French Revolution. All right. So here we go. Uh, these are just the first set of key words of two random things that are happening in the 1700s that I want you to know about. I guess the first thing is just the population numbers. And what I mean by that is during the 1700s, population numbers really went up dramatically. Um, basically, if you look at some numbers, uh, in 1700, you have uh, populations of about, in Western civilization, of about 120 million, right? And that's right in 1700. By 1790, it's about 190 million. So you are seeing much larger populations going up. Now, the interesting point about this is why does this matter? Well, what ended up happening was that there was so many more people so quickly that there was some concern that there would be too many people and there wouldn't be enough resources. There was a man named Thomas Malthus. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before, uh, but Thomas Malthus wrote an essay called Principles of Population. And he actually said, too many mouths to feed, not enough food to go around. And you go, what do you do? What do you do about that? And one of the things that document actually did is it helped encourage countries to go and colonize, to go and create more food and find more resources. Uh, so the population growth that you see in Europe in the 1700s is one of the reasons that you're going to get colonization taking place a little bit later. It was one of the one of the factors, many other factors as well. So anyways, that's one little point about life in the 1700s and growing population. Numbers. All right. The next thing I want to mention in the 1700s is a topic we've talked about a couple times and is why you marry who you marry and just children and raising of children and so forth. So one of the things we saw is in the Middle Ages, you marry someone because your parents tell you to. And in the Renaissance, you marry someone because your parents tell you to. Well, now we're in the 1700s and you marry someone because your parents tell you to. It still has not changed, even after the Enlightenment period. So this is the third time we've talked about this, and we're still at the same place that basically marriages are arranged. What does change is an interesting view on childhood and how you raise children. Uh, we mentioned Rousseau, if you remember before. And Rousseau, of course, was that Enlightenment thinker, talked about the general will and the social contract and all that. But Rousseau also wrote a lot about education. And one of his ideas is that he said it's important parents begin to develop close bonds with children from when they are very young, something that parents hesitated to do in the early 1700s. And even before that, you go, why would you hesitate to create a close bond with your child? And the answer is obvious. A lot of your you know, children are going to die. Uh, you know, the, the infant mortality rate until we get to the Industrial Revolution is very high. And you don't want to develop a close bond with your child because you don't know if they're going to live. And Rousseau and others say, no, 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 it's important you create that bond because the first few years of a child's life is where they're going to develop a lot. What's, of course, really interesting about that is anybody who has children, you know, my little two-year-old and now at home, um, is, is that they tell you from the very beginning, the first five years of that child's life is really imperative and bonding and teaching and their values and who they are that's going to impact their entire lives. And even the first year, you know, can make a huge difference. And so that's something new. One of the interesting practices that people stopped doing was the use of wet nurses. Um, and so uh, in, I don't know if you know what wet nurses are, but in the early period of the 1700s, it was still pretty common to use a wet nurse. That's essentially when you have a baby and you don't breastfeed your child, somebody else does it. And then you give it to another woman to do. Um, and by the end of the 1700s, that practice was becoming lesser used because like, you know, the significance of that bond between a mom and a child. 
So anyways, you have that as a change as well. So populations are changing, marriages are staying the same, closer bonds with children. These are all just random things in the 1700s, but you know, I told you we cover a little bit of everything in this class. There are a couple of big economic changes in the 1700s I want you to know about, what is called what are called enclosure acts and then the triangle trade. So let me go through both of those. So the enclosure acts is basically this. In England, this is specifically in England, in the 1700s, what England started to do is take this land that was big, open, common land and literally enclose it in fences. Those are the enclosure acts. Now, why does this matter? Well, these land, this common land that was used, was mainly used by peasants to take their sheep and uh, to let their sheep graze on this open land, this common land, and the British government in the 1700s said, no, 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 no more. We're going to take this land and use it for agricultural purposes. Now, this has two impacts. Number one is it creates more agriculture, creates more agricultural stability in England. They make better, more practical use of their land. That's one. But the other impact is if you're a peasant and you've got sheep, you're kind of out of work. And what that means is you have to go find somewhere else to go somewhere else. And where do a lot of them go? Cities. And so the enclosure acts are important for two reasons. One, they provide more food and more agricultural stability in England. But two, they also displace a lot of the peasants, sending them to cities, making the cities that much larger. So you have the issue of the enclosure acts. All right, so I hope that's pretty clear. The next point is, I'm going to show you on a map here, the triangle trade. So triangle trade is pretty significant, and it's the next slide here, and I'll just kind of explain triangle trade as we look at our next slide. Okay. So what is the triangle trade system? It's actually one of the more significant uh, trade systems in global history. Uh, we call it a triangle trade because, as you can see here, there are three points, right? Europe. Africa and kind of North America actually supplies to North and South America on this map. We'll just use North America and you need to know everything about it, right? So the three points, what goes from where and why it's important. So you could start from anywhere. It's a triangle, but basically I guess we could start from North America. And what do you have a lot of in North America in the 1700s? A lot of resources, raw materials, lumber, uh, silk, indigo, tobacco, all sorts of raw material. That raw material would go from North America to Europe. It would go to Europe and then that raw material would be manufactured. So you take cotton, you take indigo, and you create a blue shirt. Manufactured goods, right? Those manufactured goods would then go down to Africa and those manufactured goods were sold for slaves, for people. Um, and those slaves would then be taken from Africa back to North America and traded for more raw materials. And so this is primarily in the 1700s. So we call it the triangle trade system. Of course, it is also sometimes known as the slave trade system of the 1700s. Now, to be clear, this is, you know, a lot of people aren't aware of this. This is not the first time you had slavery um, from Africa. Actually, you could trace back the origins of the slavery, significant amount of slavery from Africa, back to about the 7th century AD when the Umayyads, I don't know if you know the Umayyads, but they were an Islamic dynasty. They ruled over the Middle East. They ruled over North Africa. They were the ones who actually began the slave trade system out of Africa. Um, it was about a thousand years later that the Europeans then built on that and did this triangle trade system. Now, of course, it's an economic thing, but it goes way beyond economics because of the human element of it. Um, you know, during the triangle trade system, there were literally millions on top of millions of people taken from Africa and moved to North America. Some were taken by force, some were bought by the people, you know, by Europeans from the people in Africa. Um, and they were sent across. And one other term I definitely want you to know here is this term middle passage, right? So we get that there and down as well as one of those key words. Because the middle passage, that's that notorious um, event where the slaves were taken across the Atlantic Ocean and were treated in the most horrific ways. Uh, there's an old movie, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it before or seen it before, called Amistad. 
If you've never seen that movie and you want to know what the middle passage was like, it was it's very brutal, it's very raw, and it's very real, but it does describe the middle passage in, in very accurate terms. Uh, obviously, this is a topic much more for U.S. history than, uh, you know, Western European history course uh, that we cover a different material, but it is definitely something that you'd want to know about. So that's the triangle trade system, the slave trade system. Definitely know all the different components to it and definitely know about the Middle Passage and, you know, how all of that, um, you know, impacted uh, the, the trade during this time. So I hope that's pretty clear and be specific, you know, don't just say raw materials, right? You know, what raw materials were taken, manufactured goods, right? And it's all on this map so you can kind of look at it carefully and you can get all the details down. All right, so those are a couple economics industries. You have the enclosure and the triangle trade system, both very important in the 1700s. All right, we move on. And some cultural entertainment, cultural entertainment issues in the 1700s, so something a little less serious. Um, um, so what do people do for fun in the 1700s? Well, one of the things people do for fun, now that you have more cities, is urban fairs. Uh, so people would go to urban fairs and you would have, you know, acrobats and you'd have, you know, you know, food to try and little, you know, individual kind of activities there. Uh, so that would be one thing that was pretty common. They did, I didn't put it down here, sports, uh, sports, but not, you know, what we think of sports today, not organized professional sports. You're talking more things like boxing, maybe horse racing, kind of more individual sports, but that starts to develop in the 1700s. Another form of entertainment in the 1700s is reading, but there's a whole new genre, novel. So I want you to think about this. Most people don't realize this. Everything you read, and you know, the things you read early in a, in a course, like you read The Prince by Machiavelli. If you read other sources, all those Enlightenment thinkers, uh, you know, two treatises on civil government, and ah, block, all of that stuff is interesting, but it's not what most people grab and go to the beach and read two treatises on civil governments, right? I do that because, well, I'm weird, and that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, you know, you pre people prefer novels to read, and you never really had that. It was in the 1700s, it's kind of a reaction to all the serious stuff written that you have these drama, novel stories written, right? Make believe of all sorts of, of crazy adventures, and so that's the birth of the novel period. You had the dramas. Remember, the Greeks came up with plays and dramas. But the idea of just writing a whole novel, that's, that's not too common until the 1700s. So, again, I always say about this course, which is nice, a lot of things that happen still impact us today, and the novel is a good example of that. All right. Art. A whole new genre of art develops in the 1700s called neoclassicism. Um, and then make sure you get Mozart. I'll talk about him in a second. Neoclassicism, well, neo, new, classicism, a return to kind of the old uh, Greeks and Romans. And let me show you what I mean by this with a couple images. So when you look at the art in the 1700s, this is an image. It's called, you know, the image of the death of Socrates. And if you look at it, I didn't tell you when it was from, you go, well, this is ancient Greek art. No, it's not. It's art from the 1700s, right? And so you're seeing a lot of the artists in the 1700s we kind of create those ancient Greek um, styles of artwork uh, or architecture, right? If I were to ask you, where is this architecture from? You go, oh, this is, you know, columns and all this stuff. It looks like Roman. Well, it's not. This is architecture in France in the 1700s. It also looks a lot like the architecture in, you know, Washington, D.C., which makes sense because if you think of our capital and the building and all that, it very much, you know, was built during this time. So here, you know, you look at this triangle up here. I think it's called a frieze. I don't remember. Uh, that's like from the right out of the Parthenon example, the, the columns, you know, the Romans built uh, these tall columns. So did the Greeks. Um, and so this, this is stuff that you could see they were taken from the Greeks and the Romans. So you have art. That's it. You know, not too important, but I always kind of like to throw a little few different things out there. Uh, this, of course, is pretty important, and music. And, of course, when you talk about music, we've got, of course, this guy named Mozart. Uh, Mozart, who was from, of course, Austria. Um, and Mozart was pretty amazing in terms of what he accomplished. I don't know how familiar you are with him. He didn't live a very long time. He lived, like, the exact date, 1756 to 1791. So he didn't live very long. And again, you don't need to memorize those exact dates. Late 1700s is fine. Uh, but by the age of 
before he was already playing a harpsichord. A harpsichord is kind of a piano-like instrument. Age of six, he was already composing his own works. And, uh, you know, that's pretty, pretty dramatic for somebody that age. And he was very famous at his time. He lived a pretty rambunctious life and didn't live very long, uh, but was able to produce some amazing music. And, I, you know, this is where I always like to give you some perspective on things. You know, Mozart did his music, what, about 250 years ago. And I want you to think about this for a second. And I always, I love doing this in class with my students and asking them this question, which is, can you think of any musicians today, current musicians, that 250 years from now, everybody will know, there'll be a household name, and they still listen to that music. We still listen to Mozart, right? We still listen to his music. His music is influential uh, to this day. Is there anybody doing music for, again, just today? So, you know, I tell them, can you think of anybody in the last... 50 years even, that 250 years from now, people will still listen to their music. I'm thinking, you know, thinking different names of, of groups and musicians. The one that sometimes comes up consistently is maybe like the, the Beatles or something. They've had a, a pretty long run up to this point, but you know, that's so far away. I mean, today we're like disposable. Everything is disposable. You're not, you know, you're, you're in for a year and then you, nobody knows who you are anymore. Uh, but, you know, that shows you the, and I, I say this to show you the kind of the, the magnificence of some of these works. You know, you got Mozart, same thing with art. I mean, you know, Michelangelo, you know, his art, you know, we, I cover that in History 110 when I talk about, uh, you know, the Sistine Chapel and this unbelievable, beautiful art that he created. And you go, wow, and it's just so amazing. And you look at art today and somebody can literally throw cow dung on a cross and call it art and you go, what the hell happened? Um, and so, you know, th th this, is, this is something that's interesting from Western civilization and the, the fields of art, how, how art and music, things have just changed dramatically. Um, but the question is not only have they changed, are these things we have today, are they long lasting? And I guess we'll never know, uh, but, you know, obviously Mozart was. So anyway, so so that's pretty cool, you know. Obviously, music, the birth of the orchestra, uh, all of that is during his time. So pretty important guy, Mozart. All right, I think I mentioned he's from Austria. If I didn't mention that before, I know that as well. All right, um, so that's a little bit of leisure activities in the 1700s. And then one last thing I want to talk about life in the 1700s. This is kind of a little short lecture. Um, this is this map. It's this crazy map. Um, and what are we looking at here? Well, remember those Eastern European countries I didn't talk a lot about? I said I'd talk more about after the midterm. Well, here you have Austria. Here in the purple on this map is Prussia. And here in the green on this map is Russia. And one of the things that happens in the late 1700s is Austria, Prussia, and Russia all get bigger. How do they get bigger? Well, Russia moves westward, Prussia moves eastward, Austria moves north, and what the three of them conquered combined was what was Poland. So Poland disappears, and this, you know, Poland has a very hard history. I think I, uh, I think I have a little, I'm, I'm going to see if I find it. I'm going to post a funny little video on it. Um, if I find it, you can watch. If I don't find it, don't worry about it. Um, but um, it's just his, unfortunately for Poland, you know, they're stuck between the Russians and Prussia. I don't know if you know this, Prussia is like basically going to be Germans. Not a good place to be stuck between them and then Austria as well. Um, and so they're invaded a lot, so much so that in uh, the late 1700s, 1795, Poland was disappeared. So it's important for two reasons. It marks the end of Poland for a very long time, uh, but also it makes Russia, Austria, and Prussia all stronger Keep that point in mind. That will be important later on after the midterm, especially uh, with Prussia and Austria. Again, these are going to be much more important nations, I think, after the midterm uh, when we come back and talk about some of this. So anyways, that's the, you know, the areas there. So that's it. Those are just a few little things about life in the 1700s that I wanted you to know about. As I told you, no one big theme to this lecture, as you notice. It's just a bunch of random things, but all important. And then our next lecture will be, of course, on the French Revolution. And that's going to be a big theme that we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time on. All right. Thank you. I hope all that's clear. And uh, um, that's it. Have a good one.